Hello, good morning to everybody. I hope you can see me and hear me clear and loud. Oh, no, sorry. Hello, good morning to everybody, and welcome to this session on clean seas with a sustainable blue economy, challenges and opportunities. Uh, my name is Frangiscos Nikolian. I'm a head of unit in DG Maritime Affairs and Fisheries, dealing with economic analysis, the markets and the impact assessments. Uh, it is, I, will, I will try now to make a, a short, uh, I would say, a set of the framework under which we are currently, uh, we are operating. And this is not uh, without doubt uh, the European Green Deal, which uh, will define the European economy for many, many years, or I, I can say decades. The European Green Deal calls for a transformation of our economy to become a modern, resource efficient and competitive economy where uh, net emissions of greenhouses greenhouse gases are phased out and the EU natural capital is protected. Under the European Green Deal, the importance of using the marine environment sustainable is vital so that marine ecosystems and their services can ma ma maintain and hence also the human activities that depend on them. The marine environment plays a very important role. We need the oceans for renewable energy, for sustainable food, for the ecosystem services they can provide like the climate regulation and the, through the carbon sequestration, the weather and air quality. In this context, the blue economy will, should, and it can play a major role. It can foster the green potential of the blue economy, uh, can also play a part in mitigating the economic impacts which have been caused by the health crisis uh, and uh, most probably leading to new growth opportunities and new jobs. And of course, to achieve these objectives under the European Green Deal, under the, uh, all, all these policies, uh, initiatives which are developed and unfold under the European Green Deal, we need reliable data, uh, which is a key for us to enable, to make informed decisions and to prepare evidence-based policy. This is exactly what the annual EU Blue Economy Report provides for an update knowledge and evidence on the economic performance and outlook of all marine and maritime sectors in the EU, and on the progress which has been made on the, in the transition towards a more sustainable blue economy. This is a, a very short and very general introduction from my side, and without further ado, I would like and to present you our uh, distinguished panelists, and I have the pleasure to uh, present you uh, uh, Mrs. Veronica Mafredi, who is the director for quality of life in DG environment of the European Commission. Uh, we have with us also Mr. Christos Economou, which is a deputy director of the Maritime Directorate in DG Maritime Affairs and Fisheries. We have also with us Mr. Jan Martison, the head of unit in GRC, the Joint Research Center for Water and Marine Resources. Uh, we, have, uh, we have the pleasure to have also Mr. Manuel Barange, which is director of the Fisheries Division Blue Transformation for a Sustainable Blue Economy in, uh, uh, from FAO, and we have also uh, Mr. Uh, Sergi Tudela, uh, which is uh, Director General of the Directorate General for Fisheries and Maritime Affairs in the Regional Government of Catalonia. So many, many thanks. It's a pleasure to have you here. And without further ado, I will give the floor to Mr. Christos Economou to uh, start uh, the debates. Christos, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, good morning, Frank, good morning, colleagues, and good morning to the participants. Uh, it's, of course, uh, an honor to me to start uh, uh, the discussion, uh, the debate, uh, and uh, uh, clearly I would like to uh, present you the context under which operates for the blue economy and also how the blue economy reports links to that. So um, I suppose uh, you can uh, see my slides already. And uh, so if we can uh, then pass to the next one, please.
Yes, thank you very much. So as you know, uh, the Commission adopted on the 17th of May a new com communication on uh, for a new approach on the sustainable blue economy. And uh, certainly uh, this has a very good basis on data and analysis. But overall, let's say, and uh, Fran, you from the very beginning made the connection to the goals we have set uh, collectively in the EU under the 2030 agenda, uh, considering, of course, the Sustainable Development Goal, and Sustainable Goal 14 particularly, and the Green Deal calling for the transformation of our economy. And blue economy is also part of that. And the blue economy sectors that you analyze very well in your report, uh, it's obviously uh, they are all, uh, they have their share and they have to do their part in this transformation. Uh, of course, the ocean and the seas uh, are under severe pressure from the human activities. But of course, these same activities undermine the blue economy that they try to promote. So there is, I think, an interest from both sides, environmental and economic, for this transformation. So uh, when we look onto uh, how we can achieve, for instance, carbon neutrality, then we understand that there is a big uh, part that blue economy can play into that. And I will come um, with more details uh, later on. So uh, the communication uh, that I refer to sets the vision for how we want to transform blue economy under the green axis, the green deals axis on decarbonization, zero pollution, circularity, biodiversity, and uh, climate adaptation. So uh, we also want the blue economy to be part of Europe's green recovery. Uh, it's obviously, and it's as every sector of the economy, uh, the, the blue economy sector suffered from the current crisis, the sanitary crisis certainly impacted most of them and showed the vulnerabilities of, of them. Now uh, we have the experience, we have the right timing to promote uh, the resilience and to promote uh, the recovery under these new objectives of uh, environmental protection, of biodiversity, of decarbonization. Uh, and, and all the other uh, things that we would like really to promote uh, for sustainable uh, goals for the blue economy sectors. Now, many activities take place at the sea. And of course, uh, the objectives that we set, it's not only for the sea itself, it is also for the land. It has to have a coherent approach towards the maritime sectors, but also bring all the different actors together. It is really a joint effort from the EU, from the regions, from the member states, of course, to promote these goals for more sustainable economy and more protected oceans and seas. Obviously, I refer to regions because at sea basin, we have specificities that need to be addressed differently. So can we go then to the next slide, please? Uh, I refer to again to the communication because it is clearly not a, an, an exhaustive action plan. It sets the vision. It sets the goals that the different players that I refer to uh, need to align themselves. Uh, I refer to the regions. I, let me refer also to the stakeholders, to the businesses, to the local groups, to the young people passionate about the health of the ocean and and the general public. They all have to play their part. We address their issues in the communication about ocean literacy, for instance, about skills, about the way uh, that all these different actors will interact through uh, the maritime spatial planning, for instance, this competition for space. So all these are explained in the communication and all these need to, uh, as I say, uh, be implemented at different levels if we want to be successful. Uh, so let me come to the next slide, please, uh, which clearly shows the uh, transformation of blue economy value chains as they presented in the communication and are in line with the, uh, the priorities of the European Green Deal. 
Now, I will only give a few elements under these pillars because it is obviously quite much, takes much, much longer to explain. Uh, for instance, when we refer to uh, decarbonization, clearly the mind goes to marine renewable energy and how we can achieve uh, the goals that we have set for 2030 and 2050. So uh, if we look into to that sector, we certainly can arrive to producing a quarter of the EU's electricity by 2050 through this uh, means, through offshore renewable energy. This is a sector where we need really to look and invest support. And the same goes for wave and tidal energy. We have the largest maritime space in the world. We really have to see how we can benefit from this unique place. Now, coming to the biodiversity, of course, we have the goals for marine protected areas that need to cover 30% of our seas, 10% to be fully protected, but we need to go farther to set restoration targets, design-based solutions to help us to adapt to climate change and protect for sea level rise. Coming to responsible food systems, of course, we continue to make an effort to manage the fisheries more and more sustainably, to make also uh, to look into alternative sources of food and feed from the sea. So all these are part of the communication, obviously highlighting the elements of the new guidelines on aquaculture that were, were also adopted last month uh, by the Commission as part of the communication. Also looking to the development of the algae sector in Europe, for instance. Looking into the circularity, let me all highlight only one element. As I mean, in Digimare, we were working also on lost uh, fishing gear and <laughs> clearly the zero pollution action plan that uh, my colleagues will present later have a lot of ambitious goals addressing to the plastic litter and last based, last based pollution uh, also regarding this, um, this uh, big uh, problem that we face. Now, let me come to uh, slide five, please. And there I'm getting to uh, the data and how much we need the data to make decisions. Obviously, the Blue Economy Report that Fran, you from the beginning explained, is really uh, the, the element that w which supports and complements this uh, communication on sustainable blue economy. Without the data, without the analysis, it's very difficult to make any um, informed decisions. Uh, as it's highlighted in the report, I mean, we, uh, if we look into the ocean as an economic entity, it would be a member of G7. We said that very often. And we have to keep in mind that uh, oceans hold 97% of our water and 80% of all life forms. So w the actions we take for ocean for addressing the way we interact economically with the ocean is really vital for our lives and uh, development as, as, as human uh, on this planet. Now, let me come to the slide six, please. And that gives an overview of the blue economy, the way it's presented in the blue economy report this year. So the blue economy sectors contribute to about 1.5 of EU 27 uh, GDP and generates 600 50 billion in turnover. It has, of course, uh, a direct uh, impact on jobs, 4.5 million direct jobs and 2.3% uh, of EU27 total employment. Uh, it is uh, clearly uh, a mix of both emerging innovative sectors, as the ocean uh, renewable energy I referred to, but also of more traditional uh, sectors, talking about tourism, talking about shipping, and certainly um, our work under for sustainability will certainly have an impact on all these figures. Let me come to slide seven, uh, because that I will present you the case of one particular sector I mentioned already, the coastal tourism, which presents actually the highest share of employment, 64% and 45% of growth value added in the blue economy. And you see also um, how much uh, it impacts the overall figures. Now, 
it is one of the sectors also which was mostly impacted by the pandemic. Huh? I believe in the next editions of the uh, Blue Economy Report, we will certainly uh, present figures uh, about this and uh, certainly one of the sectors where mostly we need to address uh, how we best uh, the recovery and the transition towards a greener uh, formula. Now, uh, let me come to slide eight, uh, please. And this is related to the link between blue economy and the coastal ecosystem. Uh, obviously, from the start, I said, if we don't protect this ecosystem, then how can we develop the economy around it? And uh, protecting really the costs, it's, it's really uh, the, one of the main uh, objectives when we realize that almost 50, 500 billion worth of services are generated within 10 kilometers of the coastal zone on a yearly basis in the EU. So the coastal regions need to develop green infrastructure to preserve biodiversity and preserve at the same time the economy that it is really developed around uh, this zone. And of course, maintaining sustainability is a way to maintain the economy in this zone. Now. Uh, we are looking also to how to have alternative sources for food and protein. And this can alleviate, of course, the pressure on climate and natural uh, resources uh, from, for the food production. Um, let me come also to the way we need reliable and harmonized ocean data. And the DGMARE and the Commission is working on a new initiative, actually, on ocean observation data in the way that we can protect ourselves by better using the data and the available information we have regarding uh, the, uh, the changes in the ocean and how this can uh, impact uh, the costs, coastal, coastal zone and our costs uh, specifically. Now, the other element which is crucial is of course, marine and maritime research and they have to do their part for uh, achieving EU ambition in becoming climate neutral uh, by 2050. And we look in all these innovative uh, solutions also as part of developing sustainable blue economy sectors. Chris, Chris, sorry, can you resume? I'm fine, I'm finishing, yeah. I'm finishing. And uh, my final remark, uh, Fran, is that obviously the blue economy report and the sustainable blue economy communications are part of what we can collectively show as uh, the, uh, the, the framework and the direction we want to take for the blue economy. And this is also part of the European Green Deal, of course, that the colleagues will develop uh, in their interventions. Thank you very much. Thank and you, uh, you. I'll stay here for any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christos. So what, uh, what a start of uh, presenting the general, uh, I would say, uh, overarching and uh, regarding the, the blue economy, sustainable blue economy communication. And you give us a, a perfect, let's say, pass to go to the next speaker very, very rapidly uh, to uh, Jan Martinson from GRC, uh, who is the main and uh, our major uh, collaborator for producing this Blue Economy Report. Uh, and, and we are very, very much thankful for this. Please, Jan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, and it's great to be with all of you. Good morning. Fantastic. Actually, um, Fran and also you, Chris, as you said, a, a really a great scene for me. So we heard a lot about the blue economy already um, and also the need for data. And I, I'm here because I would like to show to you that I deeply believe that um, if you want to advance the blue economy in a sustainable way, we need to base this on scientific evidence. And I will show you why I think this is important. I will introduce you to the complexities I see inherently to this um, endeavor. And we'll give you some examples where science actually contributes valuably to the sustainable blue economy. Next slide, please. Right, so what was already hinted at? We are looking, first of all, in the oceans at a highly complex system. And if we are very honest to ourselves, is we must admit we don't understand the marine realm. The knowledge gaps we have are really, really very worrisome, and we need to fill these gaps. Secondly, of course, we cannot look at the oceans alone. So we know that the oceans provide, on one hand, a huge opportunity for our prosperity, well-being, 
But on the other hand, they experience enormous pressures, which we need to get uh, grips to grips with. And this is linked, of course, to land-based systems and also to the air. Everything is interconnected. So it is not sufficient just, just to understand the oceans, but we need to understand uh, where the pressures come from, starting from the land, starting from freshwater systems. Next slide, please. Yes, we do understand that our life and survival depends deeply on the oceans. Actually, as the oceanographer Sylvia Earle once put it, no water, no life, no blue, no green. And I think this really very well encapsulates what we are talking about. So from the scientific point of view, this means for us that we have to accept the complexity of the um, ocean systems and we have to work across different research fields and collaborate. But more than that, it also means when we talk about the sustainable blue economy and fun and Christos were already alluding to that, we need to actually take approach <clears throat> across different um, stakeholders. Like if you want to understand the economy, we have to take on board the society. And of course, we need to understand the environment we're talking about. I believe, and this brings me to the main subject of the EU Green Week 21, that the zero pollution ambition of the European Union sets a fantastic framework steering to that this ambitious goal of integrating everything. Next slide, please. And this is where we come in when it comes to scientific advice. The Joint Research Centre as a Director General of the European Commission is often named the scientific arm of the Commission, actually. And what we do is we help our policy making colleagues to base their decisions and their development of policies on best available scientific advice. To that end, actually, the integrated knowledge and expertise, not only from the research realm, but also from the industry, from um, other stakeholders, and also actually all of us as citizens, we try to make sense of this and feed this into the specific needs of the whole EU policy realm. And this is, of course, also true on one hand for the sustainable blue economy, where, as Juan rightly said, we collaborate with you, um, DG Mare, on the EU blue economy report. But this is also actually our goal when we talk, for example, on something as ambitious as the zero pollution strategy of the European Union. Next slide, please. Here, one example where we actually make a major effort to drive a more coherent and systemic view on the blue economy forward. Christos, you mentioned already circularity. And indeed, we need to move forward from a linear economic model to a circular one. We need to minimize waste and we need to keep resources in use rather than getting rid of them. 20 percent basically of the material that will come to that that we use is at, and at the moment ending up at waste, some and most of it in the oceans ultimately. We need to base our dealing with material on reuse, recycle and recover. And this brings us to the analysis of supply chains, uh, which is um, really a very important ingredient to that and end of life waste management. Um, next slide, please. And without being able to go further into this, I invite all of us actually to visit the European platform on life cycle assessment, which helps, for example, the industry to get a grips to get to grips with the conditions of circular economy, of a true circular economy, but it's such a huge um, treasure of information that all of, the, uh, all of us can tap into. Next slide. Right, so this will feed, like the circular economy will feed, and we already um, uh, accommodate this in the uh, blue economy analysis that we perform. More than that, and I already mentioned, we need to come to greater coherence and also build really a community when we tackle a sustainable blue economy. So the coherence here means, as I said, we need to um, address uh, pressures on the oceans, not only from the oceans, but also from land-based systems and actually also the air. Community means, as a colleague of mine put it, all hands on deck. So we all, scientists, policymakers, citizens, the industry need to work together in order to uh, move forward to a sustainable blue economy. Next slide. And the same is, of course, very true for the zero pollution ambition of the European Union, which to a vast extent will also um, underpin the uh, sustainable EU blue economy and vice versa. Next slide. And here I would like to point out that actually the EU legislation already um, is based on a, a great number of legislation which really has at its core the protection of our environment. 
So we see here the bathing water directive, drinking water directive, urban wastewater directive, the water framework directive, marine, marine strategy framework directive, and the common fisheries policy. And we need to bring these together and really find, um, on one hand, um, really uh, common points of them, how we can address them with common approaches, also being underpinned by scientific advice. Very interestingly, and I think this is really fantastic and, and a paradigm, the basic regulation of the common fisheries policy insists legally on the provision of best available scientific advice. And we should drive that forward, take us as an example to underpin the other legislation, to bring this together and to under, uh, let, let this help the sustainable blue economy on one hand and also the zero pollution ambition combined on the other hand. Next slide, please. Right, decoupling, actually. This belongs also to the idea of circular economy. Um, we are using um, too many resources. In um, 2017, 90 gigatons of uh, primary resources, um, such as uh, um, yeah, fuel and, and, and metal and what you have. And 20% of these materials end up actually in waste. We need, when we say decouple, we need to address scientifically also the idea that economic growth can be the couple of increasing uses of our precious material resources. And this is what we are working on also in the context of the Blue Economy Report. Next slide, please. And I would like to draw all of you um, to a recent publication of the Joint Research Center, which very nicely assesses actually our progress when it comes to decoupling economic growth from environmental impacts and the use of primary materials. And this uh, is a reflection and uh, illumination of what is going on on the EU member state level. It's a very interesting read, not only for scientists, but for all of us. Next slide, please. Right, so circular economy, uh, decoupling, feeding into a sustainable blue economy. Another very important aspect is, of course, putting a value on oceans. This is highly problematic. Classically, we look at fisheries, we look at shipping, uh, ports, for example, and we have a clear link to our GDP, for example, to employment. But of course, what the oceans offer us is so much more. Ecosystem services. It's the biggest carbon sink we know, actually. So it has a huge impact on our climate. And we need to take this into account. Next slide, please. And what we are really aiming at, together with our colleagues, with Franz's uh, team, for example, is in, to develop and integrate a methodology to integrate the concept of natural capital in economic decision making and policy making under the remit of the sustainable blue economy. And I think this is absolutely crucial and it's highly complex and difficult. Next slide, please. Right. As a final point, I would like, and this was already nicely introduced by Christos, I would like to point out that if you look at the blue economy, what is super important is that you have reliable data, as you put it, Christos, and that we can use this in order to monitor what is going on actually in the European Union and global context when it comes to the blue economy. Yes, we accept that the oceans offer a huge opportunity for prosperity and well-being. We know that we're looking at a fragile system. So we need to have means to see actually what happens when we exploit marine resources. We do this, and I can only recommend to you to read the hot of the press Blue Economy Report 21 here, which has all the information that, that um, we could uh, compile together with DG Mare. And what we look at is, for example, of course, classical analysis contribution to the GDP. But what I'm very proud of, and when I look at this, and I think, Fran, that's the same for you, and proud of being of our team, basically, who is able to do that, is also a reaction to very unforeseen new huge impacts, such as COVID-19. Christos, you already mentioned this, and indeed, COVID-19 had a huge impact on tourism, also on fisheries, and this is very well documented in, in, the, document in the Blue Economy Report, along with Brexit, for example, also. And then, and this brings me back to the natural capital, um, um, discussion that I introduced and also looking at the oceans in a more holistic view when it comes to value. And we also analyze, for example, climate change impacts on the blue economy. And this is, of course, a fantastically valuable tool, for example, also for you, Veronica, and your colleagues, in order to see what is really going on with our oceans. How will the environment change? What impact does this have on one hand on the environment, on the other hand, on our well-being and future prosperity? Next slide, please. 
Well, I hope I could convince you that we really need to base our blue economy analysis, if you want to go towards a sustainable blue economy, also, also I say, on science. So I invite you to listen to science on one hand, but also to engage with us researchers, with the research community, if you are policymakers or citizens, it doesn't matter. Be critical, engage in discussions with us, tell us also where you see there are weaknesses of our approaches. And I think together we can really create a very nice path towards a truly sustainable blue economy. Next slide. With which I, I would like to finish and thank you for listening to me. And it is really an honor and privilege to be with you here together today. Thank you. Many, many thanks, uh, Jan, for this comprehensive, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, debate regarding the scientific and science uh, behind uh, what we are discussing. Uh, one could, couldn't agree more that we need to listen to the science, that's for sure. And that's why we are together, policymakers and the scientists, uh, in, in order to go uh, along uh, in, this, in this endeavor. So many, many thanks. Uh, I, without further ado, I will give the floor to Veronica to hear from the expert of, on the environment uh, and, and to, to develop, uh, in particular, the latest uh, policy initiatives which have been developed by DG Environment. Veronica, the floor is yours. Many, many thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Nicole. And, and the beauty of uh, speaking as a third speaker in this distinguished panel is that my colleagues have so well set the ground. Maybe in the meantime, the colleagues uh, from the technical service can put on uh, the PowerPoint presentation. And I wanted to exploit to the moment just to say that I think that after Jan's presentation and of course what Christo said, you all understand why uh, flagship eight of our zero pollution action plan says that we want to transform both the JRC and uh, the uh, European Environment Agency as the knowledge center of excellence for the European Union on zero pollution. The skills are there, the data are there, it's about pulling the strings in the right manner so that we will become much more targeted in our interventions. This slide that you see on the screen essentially tells you, in other words, what you have already heard, that indeed uh, marine activities are dependent upon the natural capital held in Europe seas, but at the same time that all the activities that you exert, and not only at sea, of course, have a lot of impact, exert a lot of pressures, and among those, marine pollution is of particular importance as it threatens the health of the seas and jeopardizes their use for commercial recreational activities and as we have understood and this is a one-liner i will reuse water imagine sea is life and without that uh, without blue there is no green so we can move to the next slide please marine pollution concerns different type of pollutant impacts to the seas such as chemicals particularly big challenge and other toxic substances plastics, nutrients, but also underwater noise that I would like to stress and other inputs from uh, energy. Sources in majority are indeed land-based activities. And we think here of industrial emissions, agricultural runoffs, landfills, uh, badly managed uh, waste, uh, untreated municipal sewerage, chemical illegal discharges in rivers and, in flood, and of course flood waters, littering of beaches and coastal areas. Let's move to slide four. Over the last uh, 13 years, the Marine Strategy Framework Directive has sought to achieve good environmental status of all our marine waters. Although the ambitious goals have not been achieved in 2020, as initially foreseen by this 2008 directive, we still see how much this directive has enabled a better understanding of the pressures and of the impacts of these human activities on the sea. Now, it is for this reason that we have just embarked on a very ambitious review process of this directive. But let's move to the next slide, on which I will only say super briefly, because I think Christo did an excellent presentation uh, already, that essentially what you can see and read in the sustainable blue economy communication that we have just uh, adopted shows 
that it is possible to promote sustainable fishing and tourism, sustainable production and marketing of seafood, sustainable production of renewable energy. See that actually we want to see greatly increase the provided is done indeed in a sustainable manner. Decarbonization jointly with the pollution of maritime transport and the greening of our ports. Uh, as uh, our commissioner says all the time, when it comes to the seas and the ocean, the environment is the economy. So marine environmental protection is compatible with the sustainable use of seas and resources. And yes, the sustainable use of the seas and its resources can in turn contribute to protecting the environment. We are here not in the economy, but in a perfect harmony, if we get it right. So let's move to the next slide. Environment is most precious when it is pollution free. Uh, this is why the Zero Pollution Action Plan for Air, Water and Soil that we have adopted last May the 12th present a comprehensive roadmap of what it will take to jointly move towards a toxic free environment, aligning our vision to the 2050 climate neutrality goal. Among other main targets, our plan aims to prevent and reduce pollution to borders and oceans to facilitate remediation in a stepwise but also in reversible manner. Our oceans are therefore direct beneficiaries. And I really believe that our common love for fresh waters and sea can be the key driver for the needed economic and societal change. We need also at the same time to untap into the yet larger use potential of digital solutions. And again, I very much count on my knowledge partners to get there. Let's move to the next slide. As one of the deliverables of the Zero Pollution Action Plan, the review and the subsequent um, evaluation, uh, the ongoing evaluation of the Marine Strategy for Moderating is really a golden opportunity. Uh, and here, I really wanted all of you to please engage as much as possible in the review. I have the impression we should move one slide further. Uh, there is a little decalage. So if the colleague can move next slide. Yes, exactly. Because this is the slide I wanted you to focus now. Uh, just also to tell you that if you go, please, on the website, you have your say. You can follow etap by etap, step by step, all our ongoing consultation process. This is a major ongoing review on which I would like each of you to please stay engaged. And let's move to the next slide again because you will see that another important uh, review I want to draw your attention to is the one of the Bathing Water Directive, which, uh, through which we are assessing whether the current rules of that directive are still fit for purpose to protect at the same time public health and of course improve water quality. Um, so having called for your engagement, I would like to move now to the next slide which will tell you something nice that I think we all need after this very long COVID-19 pandemic. Speaking of growth of tourism uh, and, you know, the communities that depend on that, there is one factor that influences the recreational experience and the results in the attractiveness of holiday destination. Clearly, this is the bathing water quality. I don't know whether you know, but over 200 million, 200 million of our 500 million citizens in Europe live in coastal regions or on one of Europe's many islands. About one third of the EU population lives within 50 kilometers from our coast. Two thirds of baiting sites are located along the sea coast of Europe. Over half of EU's tourist accommodation establishment are located in coastal areas. And 30% of overnight stays are at beach resorts. I think we're all dreaming of that uh, right now, isn't it? I have good news for all of you, uh, dear uh, European friends. We do not need to travel too far to find a bathing spot and excellent water quality. Uh, the data just published by the colleagues of the European Environment Agency show also for 2020 that uh, the share of excellent bathing sites in Europe have been growing continuously. In 2020, over 85% of the EU coastal bathing sites were classified as of excellent quality. And a large number of clean bathing borders is beneficial, of course, not only for safe recreation, but as I said, for environment and economy. Let's move to the next slide. The overall good quality uh, of, uh, well, I think we can move already to the next one because we, we touch a bit already on the sustainable blue economy. So next slide, please. 
uh, the overall good quality of European bathing site should be seen really as an encouraging factor for promoting climate-friendly, sustainable, nature-based travel experiences, also not far from home. Sustainability is expected to become more prominent in tourist choices. This is a trend that we see out of the polls that we are carrying out. Uh, with regional, local destination driving the recovery after the pandemic. So let's move again to the next slide, where uh, I would like really to invite you to look at the results of the last report and choose, please, the closest and hopefully already pretty much a zero polluted bathing water destination next to you. And again, to thank all the colleagues, because we are today just kicking off a very good adventure to connect all the data and integrate our policies at best. Thanks. Veronica, many, many thanks for your intervention. What excellent news we, we are getting. I'm reading since yesterday a lot of articles in the press about the quality of uh, our bathing waters. Uh, summer is approaching, and I, I do believe that this is very, very good news uh, from, from uh, what has been done and achieved all these years uh, for, for, from you. I also like very much the word you said, harmony, uh, and this is something which we, we need to pay attention because, yes, uh, um, economic performance and sustainability can go hand by hand. This is this is something which we have actually uh, uh, managed to do uh, evidence in particular regarding uh, the fisheries sector where we do see that where we manage sustainably the stocks, the economic performance of the fleets are also uh, improving. So uh, this is this is a, a very, a very good message. So without uh, delay, I will go to our next panelist uh, who is uh, going to give us i hope uh, the global perspective uh, so manuel the floor is yours thank you very much um nicole and, and thank you everybody for your presence here today um i i guess we're still going to have the same process that someone uh, centrally is going to pass the slides otherwise i would i could do that myself but um i would like to talk to you a little bit about blue transformation and of course i'm going to focus on the fisheries and agriculture sector but the term transformation has already been used today uh, in the context of a sustainable blue economy uh, next slide i'm going to pass this slide because it's been so many uh, already introductions to the blue economy that I don't need to say so much, but um, can you please click three times on the slide? <clears throat> next. And next. And next again. Right, that just defines what is the blue economy, what it is origin from the 2012 uh, Rio uh, plus 20 conference and when applied to the ocean is the blue economy and it requires um, transformation to develop these opportunities that the blue economy offers in a sustainable manner. Next. Right. So first of all, uh, I just want to um, make a very clear point about the fact that blue transformation is something that has been happening already very dynamically for some time, almost under the radar. So in 1995, the FAO uh, countries endorsed the Code of Conduct for Responsible Fisheries, which is a document that you have on your screen on the left. At that point, this was the trend in captured fisheries and aquaculture in globally. And you can see fisheries growing or almost seem to be uh, unstoppable uh, with aquaculture only incipient. This was what led to the 1995 Code of Conduct. Next. Now look at what happens now. You know, the, 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 we have the 2020 data already, but in this figure we have until 2019. From the moment that the Code of Conduct was implemented, uh, fisheries, global fisheries stabilized, which is not a bad thing at all. Uh, part of it is because of regulation and better management. And that led to also the, the incredible growth of aquaculture, the fastest growing food production system in the world since then. Um, and the development as well, not just uh, aquaculture for fish and mollusks and, and crustaceans, but also plants, as you can see in green. And for this reason, next, uh, the Code of Conduct, uh, the, the, the Committee on Fisheries of the FAO uh, this year, 2021, published a declaration for sustainable fisheries and aquaculture. And that declaration was actually a direct response to this dynamic transformation in the sector, trying to um, particularly demonstrate the incredible role that fisheries and aquaculture have in combating poverty and in feeding the world. It, through this declaration, also, also identified the priority areas for transformation of blue foods, reiterating the incredible potential of aquaculture and the uh, importance of focusing 
further transformation on livelihoods, on gender issues, and on supporting vulnerable groups. Finally, it also mentioned that science and knowledge need to be democratized and need to be used to the full to make sure that this transformation is effective and is sustainable. Next. So, not only has been a dynamic reality, <clears throat> blue transformation is an absolute necessity. And this figure shows you why. Uh, this is the uh, publication uh, from the FAO State of Food Security in the World. And the latest issue shows that the number of undernourished people in the world has been growing for the last five years or six years. It, this is actually a change in trend from previous decades where we were seeing a decline in, in undernourishment. And more worrying still is that the projection from FAO is that the number of undernourished people will grow to almost 850 million by 2030. This will be a catastrophic reality. So we need to make sure that this does not happen. This is why there is a growing necessity uh, of blue transformation. Next. And uh, this uh, emphasizes even more. This is the, the surface of the planet in percentage showing the 71% that comes from the ocean. In yellow, that we, you have the, the, the section that is divided, de, de, devoted to agriculture, and in green, devoted to forests and shrubs. Uh, increasing ag agriculture production in, in area would have also very negative Im implications for the, the health of the planet. So the, the, food transfer, the blue transformation, the blue foods idea is crucial in that uh, context. Next. This has been recognized already for some time, and there's a number of documents that have been published, including from the European Union on food from the oceans, on the future of food from the sea, uh, on the role of aquatic foods, uh, on uh, sustainable and healthy diets, that point out the need for uh, to look at oceans and seas and freshwater ecosystems as well, as we look at the, the future of food. Next. So what do we mean by blue transformation? And what are the core objectives from a blue transformation from a fisheries and aquaculture perspective, of course, yeah, the, this in, in this meeting, there have been also references to the, the full context of the blue economy, which is beyond fisheries and aquaculture, but you know we all have our context and my context is fisheries and aquaculture. Um, the blue transformation idea from FAO's perspective has three uh, core objectives. The first one is to feed the world through aquaculture intensification. And that requires scaling up and transferring knowledge through sustainable development uh, opportunities. Next, the second objective is to transform fisheries through better management, addressing uh, overfishing, uh, addressing IOU fishing, and rebuilding overexploited stocks. And the third overarching core objective, next, is to improve the fish value chain efficiency, uh, the viability, and their inclusiveness. Um, and that includes intensifying and management solutions. Um, sorry, because intensifying and managing solutions are uh, essential, but are not sufficient to secure blue transformation. Next slide. So a little bit more detail on these three uh, objectives. The first uh, objective, the sustainable aquaculture intensification. The target is to ensure that by 2030, we have a growth of around 30 to 45% in global aquaculture production. Uh, this is particularly focused on food deficit regions. Remember that Africa only produces about 2.5% of the global aquaculture production. Um, China alone produces almost 60% of the world's aquaculture. There is a possibility and a potential for uh, aquaculture intensification in many regions. There's a number of priority areas that we're focusing on. Innovation in feed ingredients and technologies, uh, genetic improvements and diversification, uh, biosecurity and disease control, uh, use of digital technologies and intelligent systems of production, uh, all, all in the context of ecosystem approaches, um, and that includes you know, treatment of, of effluents and, and the like. And finally, climate change impacts on opportunities, because climate change provides opportunities for aquaculture development in certain regions. Next. The second component, the transformational fisheries management, has one particular target, and that is to restore fish stocks to levels capable of producing maximum sustainable yield. This is what uh, the UN, UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, and, and uh, the World Summit for Sustainable Development all pointed towards, you know, ensuring that we have fish at those levels. 
Um, and that focuses on providing effective management in 100% of seascapes and waterscapes. Many places do not have effective management in place. Uh, and the reasons are complex. So the priority areas here are quite diverse, it includes improving the data collection systems, which are very deficient in many places around the world, developing uh, data limited stock assessment methods and management plans for capacity limited places. And that includes securing access rights and sustainable use. We cannot have uh, the gold standards that perhaps we expect in certain countries to be implemented worldwide because of clear capacity deficiencies. We need to develop innovative compliance and enforcement methodologies, particularly, uh, or not exclusively, but particularly for small scale fisheries. Um, we need to look at climate change, which has been mentioned already today. It is essential to develop adaptation options for climate change. And this is something that is not at all advanced. And it requires very careful assessment, not just of the methods, um, but also the institutions uh, that provide management support. And of course, integrating and aligning national and regional management. Uh, regional management organizations are increasingly important in the fight for sustainability and we need to strengthen them further third um, next slide please and the third component upgrading and innovating fish value chains the target here is to make uh, um, to increase the returns from free fish value chains through less waste uh, less losses and discards better yields and new markets and removing barriers to trade when possibly when possible there are many priority areas there but the objective of course is to reactivate those value chains that have been so deeply affected by the COVID 19 pandemic um, the pandemic has also identified some potential solutions so we need to do better analysis of the value chains um, secure zero waste or the in the fish value chains provide digital solutions uh, which have been so effective uh, already in in, in in treating the effects of the pandemic creating innovation in products, including uh, novel products. This is particularly the case when it, when it comes to climate change. We need to educate the consumer to identify new uh, foods that perhaps the consumer is not used to. Um, food safety risk analysis, a significantly important area of work. Uh, ensuring that we educate the consumer and the public uh, on the important role that aquatic foods play as part of healthy diets and within planetary boundaries and as i mentioned consumer education and awareness next Manuel, can you can you, you resume <laughs> sure um thank you i think that i just two more slides this okay uh, great thank you um if if you can click next I'll, I'll speak to these slides together um the blue transformation is not just an idea we have actually estimated projections of fisheries and aquaculture growth uh, between now and 2050 based on a number of assumptions um, the blue transformation if effectively um, uh, implemented well, we estimate that will provide 25.6 kilograms of fish products per person per year by 2050 that's a 25 percent growth from currently if we fail on blue transformation we will go down to about 18 kilograms per person per year which is what we used to consume 10 days 10 years ago so we really need to make blue transformation uh, a reality and next uh, slide now this blue transformation comes at a great time i call it a decade of blue transformation why because we we are entering a decade of ecosystem restoration we're entering the decade of action in the implementation of the sdgs and a decade of ocean science for sustainable development three uh, interlocking decades that start with the food system summit later this year and the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture next year. So there are a lot of initiatives pointing this in this direction. Blue transformation is a reality. We need to make it happen. And I trust that uh, many of you, including the European Union, will be behind us in pushing this agenda forward. Thank you very much, and, and apologies for the extensions. There. Thank you, thank you very much, Manuel, for 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 this uh, appeal for for blue transformation in order to secure uh, our objectives for the future globally but also in the eu uh, we don't have a lot of time we will go fast to to the uh, last but not least speaker uh, uh, just to say to the uh, our audience that they can ask questions if if they do feel it uh, we don't have a lot of time but please go go ahead so uh, i give right now the uh, the, the floor to mr tudela uh, to to make uh, his presentation please mr sergi the floor is yours you are unmuted. You are muted, uh, Sergio. Yes. 
Thank you, and good morning, everybody, and thank you uh, to the organizers for this opportunity to be here today to this most interesting session. Uh, first, I have to call on your on your indulgence, uh, Frank, uh, because I have already run out of my time before even starting. So, being delayed, this is something that you know is, is it, it it happens. Okay, so okay, my my I will focus this presentation on how uh, participatory maritime governance. Uh, delivers on sustainable management. So my role, I understand, is to take you uh, a little bit to the field, in this case to the sea, and particularly to the Mediterranean, which is always a nice place to be, right? Uh, and then I will I will go through uh, some few selected examples as case studies to give a flavor on how we are uh, delivering on this uh, sustainable management of, uh, of the seas, okay? So, okay, uh, okay, I'm able to, to go through the slides myself. Okay, I'm happy. So, uh, first idea is that Catalonia is one of the most maritime-based economies uh, in Europe, which compares to, 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 to states like Portugal or Estonia. We know that because last year on the EU Blue Economy Report uh, 2020, uh, we developed a case study, which showed that uh, over 5% of employment and almost 4% of the gross value added of the uh, Catalan uh, economy uh, relies on the sea. Uh, which is the same as saying uh, that rely on marine ecosystem services. So that's first idea. And so it's not, uh, it's not strange, it comes naturally that uh, we develop uh, our first maritime strategy uh, three years ago in May 2018. So uh, as you can see in our, in our in the vision of this uh, strategy with a horizon at uh, 2030, uh, we embed in this uh, in this uh, in this uh, vision uh, most of the elements. Most of the, it's completely aligned to the sustainable development goals in the sense that it says that Catalonia fully develops the potential of the blue economy. So it's about developing blue growth, uh, guaranteeing social and territorial balance. So social issues are of course relevant. The, th the three leg sustainability and based on resilient, biodiverse, and fully functional ecosystems that generate the highest quality services for society. So it relies a lot on the idea of ecosystem uh, preserving and, and, and restoring uh, ecosystem services. So uh, it has, our strategy has two pillars, uh, blue economy or blue growth, sustainability, uh, improvement of citizens' quality of life. Of course, I'm not going to enter into details right now, but I, I would like to focus your attention on the fourth one, which probably is our most distinctive or a unique uh, element, which is uh, governance, is this idea to, uh, to, to, to develop this participatory uh, governance. So uh, the idea is clear, is that participatory governance is the crucial game changer, which, in, which means empowering maritime stakeholders at the scale that matters. This idea of decentralization uh, is really important. And uh, to every type, uh, the scale that matters to what? To every type of decision-making process, okay? So uh, this set, uh, I will go through, this is our main umbrella. This is uh, the, 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 the some sort of summer summary of our maritime strategy. So uh, now I will go on uh, through some case studies, specific case studies on how we are uh, how we are declining or the, the, sorry uh, um, delivering right on, on this strategy. First idea is uh, fisheries management. So we have been uh, we have developed the first legal framework in, in Europe for fisheries uh, co-management. This uh, happened as well three years ago in 2018, after several case studies that lasted since 20, uh, 2012. Okay, so our main uh, tool are co-management committees, fisheries co-management committees, with the right, the right stakeholder mix, and that operate at the scale that matters for the fishery. So uh, typically, we have representatives from fishers, scientists, administration, and NGO. And the interesting thing is that these are not advisory committees. Uh, all these actors uh, operate on equal footing when it comes to decision making. So probably is the first, uh, the, the first uh, place in Europe where we have scientists and NGOs taking decision on fisheries, co-deciding co on fisheries. Yeah. This, uh, uh, this scheme uh, uh, really, uh, really uh, is really successful. We have already developed in, in these three years seven of such uh, co-management committees. 
which account for a little more of 10% of total fish landings from Catalonia. Actually, this year we have been participating to the FAO expert group, uh, which developed uh, guidelines for assessing the effectiveness of fisheries co-management uh, globally. Second idea is, okay, now we have, we have seen one single sector, uh, on, typically on a quite local level. Let's, uh, let's uh, upscale this model to coastal co-management. And this is... Uh, this, I'm very uh, sorry, sorry, but we are, I'm having the technicians on my back. Can you please resume uh, the presentation because we, we run out of time. I'm very, very sorry on this. Um, yes, so I... Okay. Uh, okay, so next idea is to uh, scale up from uh, fisheries co-management to coastal co-management. Let me uh, uh, now let's move from uh, from uh, co-management to biodiversity conservation. Uh, red coral fishing ban based on the best information available uh, with a pioneering replantation program for coral sales from poachers. So this is biodiversity cons uh, uh, con conservation. So this is conservation of uh, natural capital. Uh, the monitoring of recreational maritime fishing. We have uh, made the effort uh, to do this uh, assessment, which is uh, the first one in the Mediterranean at this level, which is published on the EU Blue Economy report that has a period a couple uh, we uh, weeks ago. Uh, you can you can check it uh, uh, from the from the EU Blue Economy report. Uh, we have this program uh, aim at collection of uh, litter. Uh, through our fisher, our our fishermen, we have uh, half more than half of our fishing fleets involved in this program, and uh, it's quite effective using EMFF funding. And finally, we are now developing our uh, bioeconomic cartography in order to be able to fulfill to better fulfill our responsibilities in terms of conservation of our main uh, coastal ecosystems in terms of provision of ecosystem services such as seagrasses and uh, and uh, other uh, nile beds and, and other ecosystems so okay now uh, all this has been possible thanks to this uh, maritime strategy uh, which has uh, broken silos within our own administration and that itself the, the our maritime strategy is governed through a high level uh, co-management scheme which is the catalan uh, council on maritime uh, co-management so thank you very much i'm sorry uh, no, I, I'm, I'm, my I'm, time I'm, was really very short and i did my best Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Sergi. You, you absolutely did your best, and but uh, it's so passionate this subject. With everybody is so engaged, and we, we in one hour we cannot actually debate, uh, you know, in depth. And there's so much interest also from. We do have one or two questions from the audience, but we will not have the time to reply. We will take the questions and uh, reply to them. Uh, uh, after the end of the session, I would like to thank you very, very much for your participation. What a, a, an exquisite debate we had today with all these policy uh, initiatives and messages which we, we received. We had the global perspective, we had the regional perspective, we have the EU perspective on the policies which we are going to unfold under the European Green Deal. Excellent. I would like to thank you very, very much for your participation. And also, I would like to thank our audience uh, for, for uh, watching us. Many, many thanks and uh, so long. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks. Thank you very much for all of you and sorry.